Imagine living your life after 50 and feeling energized and excited about your future. Welcome to the Women in the Middle podcast, the podcast for women who are ready to figure out what they want and create the life they deserve. Here's your host and master certified life coach, Susie Rosenstein. Hey there, welcome back to the podcast, Women in the Middle. I'm your host, Susie Rosenstein, and I am so glad to be here with you again for this week's episode, which is another interview in my series called Weekly Wow with Women in the Middle. Weekly Wow introduces you to amazing women who have something super relevant to share with you guys, with Women in the Middle. Today's episode is going to help us understand a common life circumstance for Women in the Middle, midlife divorce. Our Weekly Wow guest is a certified divorced financial analyst and founder of Divorce Financial Consulting in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. She's also the co-author of the book, When Harry Left Sally, Finding Your Way Through Gray Divorce. I'm thrilled to welcome Eva Sachs to the podcast. Enjoy the interview. Hi, Eva. Thanks so much for being with us today on the podcast. Hi, Susie. Uh, It's a pleasure to be here with you. So tell me more about this whole gray divorce thing. What is going on with the gray divorce? Well, gray divorce is really as a result uh, to a degree with boomers because there's more of us. So gray divorce is a phrase that's been adapted over the last couple of years that describes uh, people that are separating, contemplating divorce uh, after a long marriage, uh, you know, 25, 30 years plus somebody that would be over 50. So if you think of that timing, married for 30 years and um, uh, maybe married when they just got out of college. So 20 years, add 30 to that, they're 50, 55 years old. And so if we color our hair, are we still having a great divorce? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, we're hiding that. Only our hairdresser knows for sure. (laughs) And the one thing that we see, and the reason why we're seeing a lot of press about gray divorce is uh, stats tell us that uh, divorce rates have flattened out over the last couple of years. But the one growth area in separation and divorce is this demographic called gray divorce, partially because there's, there's more of us certainly, so more in that boomer uh, demographic. But there's a number of other reasons why um, the gray divorce is growing. Oh, tell us a little more about that. Well, if we think about it, there's a number of different uh, factors and reasons. Number one, um, the advent of um, online dating. So years ago where people would say, gee, I'm hanging in there with, a, with a, a marriage that's not that great, but certainly the fear of being alone. Today, if we're separating, divorcing in our 50s and 60s, the fear or the thought of being alone um, is less so because people have the opportunity to meet somebody else, certainly looking at online dating opportunities. The stigma certainly for women, as much as men, but probably more for women, where being alone uh, from a social perspective doesn't have the negative impact that it used to. You know, you're not being left out of social uh, events. I always um, see when I'm going to my local restaurant, there's more groups of women that are dining out. If you go to the theater, there's more groups of women dining out. So certainly if the fear of losing out on a social life um, was a deterrent, it's not that anymore. Oh, that's so true. Women certainly know how to get out. Exactly. And then the other thing that we're seeing that we think has had impact in this as well is the whole notion of women at that stage as being primary breadwinners. So the financial um, hesitation of saying, gee, I can't manage financially on my own. I've been the stay-at-home mom. I don't make as much money as my husband did. Um, because women historically have made less money than than men concerned about uh, retirement benefits, all of that, that's changed. As more women get into the workforce, as more women uh, are starting their own businesses, we know stats tell us that more uh, entrepreneurs are females than they are males. So from a strictly financial perspective, there's more freedom and opportunity for women to say, they're not afraid to take this big step. Oh, yeah, that's so interesting. Things really have changed. 
with every with everything that you're talking about with stigma and with um, online availability of social and business. But I bet that that financial piece still plays a big part with um, the decision to divorce later in life. Absolutely. I mean, it's still, if you think about it, divorce really comes down to money and the kids. So if we're looking at the financial elements, uh, the big concerns that people will have, not just women, but as they start looking at separation and divorce um, at that stage in life, you know, they're fundamentally saying, will I be okay? So what does that mean? Anything from, can I stay in the house that, I, that I'm living in right now? How can I afford to live in the same neighborhood? Certainly in a, a, you know, I'm in Toronto, so certainly a city like Toronto where real estate uh, prices have gone haywire over the last little while. So being able to f- afford uh, two homes on one, or two homes, two incomes, but splitting that up ends up being very challenging. What's this going to mean to my retirement plan? right? Will I have to work longer? What's going to happen to medical benefits and coverage perhaps that I had before? That, and that ends up being a major concern for, for a lot of people if they have some health issues where they, they don't have health coverage on their own, for instance, as, a, as an entrepreneur. So all of those things are riding heavily on the, on the heads and minds. Um, so it's not just strictly money, it's all the aspects around what money represents. One of the reasons I was so excited to talk to you was because of my fascination with talking to women who just don't see possibility at our age. And one of the things that you clearly help so many women with is seeing a light at the end of the tunnel. So they end up coming to you, I would imagine, not seeing all the possibility and opportunity that exists for them. Can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, Absolutely. So I think a lot of people, and there's a lot of myths around separation and divorce, and a lot of people may walk into my office or a lawyer's office or a mediator's office and think in the world of entitlements. You know, what am I entitled to? What does the law say I'm entitled to? But what do I feel I'm entitled to? You know, I'm, I'm the scorned wife because my spouse has had an affair or something like that. And so that's maybe where their mindset is at the time. And what I do is try and have them recognize that they have to look beyond that and say, okay, how do they envision their future life? How much responsibility and control might they have over that? And once they can establish that and start to think of those kinds of things, everything else falls into place behind that. So whether it's how they're looking at, at uh, their finances, how they might be negotiating their, their, their separation agreement, their settlement, coming from a place of where might I be, what my future might look like, rather than the reverse, which is typically what happens. I see. So it's a real combination of concrete things that they need to understand, like their financial situation, as well as this mindfulness component about envisioning what their future might look like. And also taking responsibility. You know, certainly we're seeing, I talked about the primary breadwinner, but we still have the classics, you know, somebody who's been a stay-at-home mom and uh, hasn't been in the workforce for a long time and um, hasn't had a lot of responsibility uh, with regard to family finances. You know, the, the other spouse has sort of managed all of that for them and are, in a lot of cases, totally unaware. So I'm always, I shouldn't be surprised after all of this time, but have no idea how much money their spouse makes, if they have a business, what's involved in the business. And so they've allowed themselves to be not part of that and think that they can't get back involved in learning about those things, not only for themselves, but certainly understanding the bigger picture. Oh, I see. And, and, and I think, you know, in the midst of all the other emotions circulating around separation and divorce, it's, it's challenging to add that to the mix as well. But it's an important piece because that's one piece that they do have control over themselves. Can you speak a little bit more about that? Because I'm sure understanding that is very surprising to them. Well, I, I'll to tell you in a simple uh, example, somebody will walk into my office and say, gee, um, I haven't paid any attention to family finances. I have no access to online accounts. 
my spouse is um, a stockbroker or an accountant they do all the they, they're good with numbers I'm not good with numbers and so it's very easy then to shut off and say well therefore I know very little I cannot be an equal participant in any kind of negotiations how on earth will this be fair to me and the answer to that is pretty simple it's not that black and white it's you know certainly learning about finances learning about you know basic things with regards to money banking um, investments and so on I hate to say but it's not rocket science so with a little bit of information and knowledge and a little bit of, of uh, wanting to learn about these things and taking away the guilt of gee I how could I have allowed myself not to know about all these things and how can I learn now it's possible and once some of that information starts coming across, and again, you know, information is power, and these women start gaining the confidence and saying, oh, it's not as complicated as I thought. Oh, I can have access to this. Oh, there was just one small thing I didn't understand about this. Gee, I've gone out and I've, I've um, connected, whether it's with my bank manager or I've actually sat down with my accountant and walked through my tax return, perhaps for the very first time in my life. <laughs> I love that. I love that you it's said not it. this black hole. Um, I love it. It's 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 very empowering. So if divorce has forced somebody to do this for the first time in their lives, that's a positive. It's not a negative. And and women do feel very empowered when they have that information, and then they gain the confidence to be able to move forward not only through the separation, but whatever is going to happen beyond that and in their own lives. And they start to see. A light at the end of that tunnel. Oh, I totally get it. And with so many of my clients, we talk about how do we believe things that we don't yet believe, but we want to believe them. So mm -hmm. I can see that somebody can't go from not even understanding where their money is or how much money comes in to I'm a rocket science when it a rocket scientist when it comes to understanding my own finances. They're not going to believe that, but they could work on some bridge thoughts to get to the point where they're open to the idea that they can understand enough to have a good sense of where they are financially or that they're capable of learning about these things and changing their thinking from, ah, I don't even know what's going on here and I'm not capable of learning to I'm open to the idea that I can move forward with an understanding of my finances is really empowering. And it does create different feelings instead of hopelessness and just being overwhelmed, you can see that those new thoughts can create feelings of confidence and motivation rather than just throwing up their hands and giving up. And what I do with the, certainly the female clients that I work with, I mean, we do it in baby steps, right? Most people are going through separation, divorce with everything, the emotions all tied in and twisted in their heads and so on. Uh, we'll say, you know, give me a small to-do list. I can't handle it all. It's all jumbled, but give me a small job to do. So let's look at where your spending is. What I do for a lot of my clients as a starting point is what I call a lifestyle analysis. Let's figure out where your money's going. What and are some of the more surprising things when you dig into that lifestyle analysis? Uh, I think uh, people are surprised uh, on all counts, um, but what's a biggie? How much they're spending on not groceries, but everything else in terms of food. Mm -hmm. so it's, uh, I have a category, I mean, most budgets have categories of groceries and dining out. I have an extra category that's called dining in. We forget how it's not just pizza anymore, but we're ordering other kinds of foods from restaurants and all that kind of thing. So we may know when we're standing in line or, you know, what we're spending on groceries every week, but those other things sort of get mixed up and oh I didn't yeah we are oh we order this we order that or I go to the the um the food store and have ready prepared foods I don't really count that as groceries so that that's a biggie and again for somebody who's who's working and has a family and is trying to manage to get supper on the table every day certainly uh cell phone plans and data plans are complicated people will say things like oh I know I pay you know, $50 or $100 uh, for my plan. Well, but they're not looking at those months where the data plan has gone a little off or where they've traveled or where the kids have downloaded a lot of stuff or where they've watched a lot of movies. So looking at that straight number and then these other numbers that come along, 
that's uh, that seems to be a common one. Um, online subscriptions of all sorts. We forget. Oh, gee, yeah, we're we're on iTunes, and oh, yeah, I subscribe to Netflix, and it's the oops, I forgot. So none of them are big, but in totality, when you add in the little bits and pieces, it starts to it starts to add up. Oh, yeah, I can totally see that. So I'm just looking at your book here. I just want to emphasize the title of it because I think it it just explains exactly what the book is about. When Harry left Sally, Finding Your Way Through Gray Divorce. And uh, when I took a look at the book, I was, because I haven't been through this before, I was, you know, really noticing how much information there was about finance. And the fact that your background is finance it's just so important to, you know, be guided by a team of people who really, really, really understand this critical element for women who may be alone for the first time in their lives. Absolutely. So I wrote the book with Miriam Korn, who's a family law lawyer, and we do uh, financial mediation together. Uh, And that really means trying to sort through the business part of, of, of the marriage. And that doesn't necessarily mean we're leaving the kids out because certainly the kids are a uh, uh, financial drain, depending on the age, there are a lot of families too. And in that gray divorce field, sometimes at the early age of gray divorce, uh, we certainly see where the kids are not quite launched, right? So they may be finishing high school in university. These are big, big spending years. So discussions around kids, what's important to them, family values all tie into those kinds of conversations uh, as well. So Uh, Although we don't specifically work on the parenting issues with with kids, and and certainly when they're in that age, they maybe don't need a lot of parenting um, uh, support conversations in in mediation, but there's a financial element to these these kids that's pretty important. Yeah, we wrote our book, uh, again, from these two perspectives, from the financial perspective and the legal, when we do mediation, say, how do those things cross over and intermingle and we and they can't be separated. Yeah, it sounds like you've made a really big contribution in this area. What would you say your best tips are for midlife women so that they will be okay? Because that being okay thing is probably the biggest fear. What are your best tips? Uh, I would say number one, get informed. Um, any area that you're not comfortable with, then uh, connect with all the professionals that are out there. If Even if you've been working with a financial advisor as a couple, you may not have the connection with them. We certainly hear that all the time. So certainly find somebody that you feel is a good fit for you um, from a planning perspective. Understand that there's financial advisors that do just investments and others that also do financial planning. And maybe that's the one to be looking out for. Um, and whether it's I mean, bank managers don't have as much say as they used to, but certainly understanding everything on the banking side, what accounts you have access to are in today's world, you've got to be savvy on online banking on online everything. Uh, and I know women tend to hesitate when it comes to anything techie, but it's really important because that's the direction of that we're heading. So you want to feel comfortable with being able to go online and, and, find, uh, look for your, your accounts, et cetera, et cetera, and maneuvering that. So that's number one. Number two, get up to speed with your spending. People will come in to see me and have a budget and a written budget, and it's something that somebody put numbers down, you know, a year ago, and it has <laughs> nothing to do with reality. So I don't call it budget because people don't like that word. It's a, it's a ugly B word. And it really is... Um, creating a spending plan and tracking spending. And it's not a fun thing to do, but maybe at this point in time, if you can track your spending for a couple of months to really get a sense of where your money is going, uh, where there may be um, those loose ends of, gee, maybe Starbucks every day is not exactly the best thing to do. Uh, (laughs) Can I be calling my... um, phone company and getting on a better data plan, etc. So it's really understanding where your money's going first and foremost. So that's number two. And number three, if you're contemplating separation or divorce, really research your options uh, around that. There's so many myths about divorce. You know, calling a lawyer isn't necessarily the 
first thing to do. Uh, we hear stories um, that are not the, the, the most pleasant experience for people, and then they get locked into perhaps a statement that somebody may have given them in a 15-minute free consultation. And a lot of what we hear sometimes and people have concerns about, they're told uh, not to, to stop talking to their spouse or not mm -hmm. communicating with their spouse. And I think that's the worst thing. That's the worst piece of advice to get. You need to communicate. You're ultim ultimately going to be negotiating. You know your spouse best. You know what their hot buttons are. Because you're separating, your communications and your relationship with your spouse isn't suddenly going to be different. So if right. the way you communicated while you were married, that's going to continue on certainly while you're negotiating. So you know that person best. You know how to approach them. You might need help in terms of strategies, whether it's from a, a counselor or a coach. How can I approach? How can I use better language? And to bring your own voice to the table and to be able to say, this is what I'm thinking. This is what I'd like to see happening. But I want to hear from your side what you're looking for. And so both, you can put each other in, in each other's shoes to say, all right, because there can, sometimes can be surprises with that kind of information. Oh, my gosh, so many surprises. And I'm just having, I'm just thinking of so many examples right now where uh, about wake up calls and how when you get a wake up call, like the realization that your marriage may be ending or that you want your marriage to end, it really um, is the thing often that shakes you up to kind of start thinking about you what you actually want which is such a midlife issue. A lot of times women our age don't, I don't know, we don't allow ourselves, we don't prioritize, we just don't allow ourselves to think, where do we want to go? What do we want to do? What is really the way we want to spend our valuable time on this planet? So I think in your world, um, separation and divorce may be that wake-up call that, um, I don't know, kind of opens the door to prompt women to start thinking in that direction once they clear up all this other stuff where they really have to step forward and take responsibility. Well, I'll tell you, Susie, in the research that we did for the book, um, people contemplate divorce for a long time and the stats tell us it's anywhere from seven to nine years. Hmm. So separation divorce is not an event. It's a process. It happens over time. You don't wake up one morning and say, that's it. Right. Back, you're going to say there's been things that have been happening. You shouldn't be surprised. Right. And people come to the edge of, I call it the, the cliff and they look over the cliff and say, am I going to jump today? No, I'm not. <laughs> Maybe tomorrow. No, I'm not. And eventually they get to the cliff to end up saying, no, I can't be in this marriage anymore. Wow. Seven to nine years. That surprises yeah. me. I thought I would, I don't know. I guess I was thinking it was maybe two or three years, seven to nine. Seven to, and especially when we're looking at that gray divorce uh, grouping where people are just growing apart. There mm -hmm. isn't one thing that has caused um, a strife. It's if they're looking back and they may say, yes, things were on the rocks for a while, or we weren't communicating well, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the last uh, thing I, I wanted to say to this uh, on this uh, topic is we hear people saying all the time, well, we want to do this amicably. Certainly in gray divorce, you're not at the stage where you can be spending a lot of money fighting and going to court. You might as well take the money you've got and burn it. <laughs> because you, have, no, you haven't got the time to recoup um, the right. money you would be spending. And so we hear a lot of uh, couples or clients that come in to see us and will say things like, well, we, we, we're really going to try and do this amicably. And then they may talk to their friends, you know, a few months later, and they say, yes, we started off amicable and it turned ugly. They never say we turned ugly. So there's the process that allows people to start going into their own corners, thinking they have to fight thinking they have to, we hear the words all the time, protect myself. Mm -hmm. We always ask the question, from what? <laughs> what do they so say? Their answer. Uh, but that's what happens. It, it's all those myths. This is what's supposed to happen. I'm supposed to protect myself. I'm supposed to not mm -hmm. talk to my spouse. I, what's going to happen if I move out of the house? It, it, it's very, it, it's none of those things are necessarily uh, true. And so keeping focused on if you really, truly uh, want to engage, if you really want to honor your marriage, certainly a lot of the great divorcing couples, um, 
as much as they're not happy and they want to move on with their lives, are also saying, but I do want to, I can't ignore the last 30 years of my life. I can't just say it disappeared and it never happened. So there's a balance there where they still care about the relationship, not in the same way that we think of. But those are the couples that are saying, we hope we won't end up fighting. We really, we're going to try really hard. And it's very sad when they end up in a situation where not through the fault of their own, they end up fighting. Hmm. Well, overall. You, and you're not further ahead in doing that other than, you know, your bank account is, is empty. Right. I see what you mean. Well, overall, I find uh, what you're saying is, is very hopeful that maybe uh, couples and people in gray divorce, um, you know, we're older and wiser. <laughs> and it sounds like with your guidance and the insights and the research backing and the wisdom that uh, we have with age, there is more potential for um, things to move forward in a way that everybody feels honors their relationship like you were talking about. You know, we've seen hundreds of couples through our, certainly our, our mediation practice, not all of them gray, but many of them gray. And they do come out the other end stronger, happier, and don't have, um, they haven't had a bad experience. But it's, it's their mindset of when they're first coming in and saying, we do want to do this, as I say, in an amicable, reasonable, efficient way where we still want to be able to say, you know, we can all attend our kids' weddings. Right, exactly. Eva, your message today was so useful. I know you're going to be helping a lot of women in the middle. How can they find your book, When Harry Left Sally? Well, When Harry Left Sally, there's a website. So it's just when Harry left Sally.ca. There's information there about the book and certainly uh, how to purchase the book. And can people for your services, do people need to be in Ontario to contact you for your services or not? Well, they can be across the uh, country. Okay, great. And what's your website there? It's very simple. It's evasax.com. And the mediation website, uh, if somebody is interested in learning more about our mediation services, is Mutual Solutions. Okay, awesome. So I'm going to have all of those links and information on the notes page, the show notes. So if you're interested in following up with Eva, it'll be so easy for you to do that. Thank you so much. The information today was amazing. Thank you, Susie. I really enjoyed it. That's it for this episode. If you like what you've heard, just head over to the Women in the Middle podcast on iTunes and leave me a review. Check out the show notes with more information and links at www.susierosenstein.com. While you're on my website, if you haven't done so yet, make sure to grab your copy of my free ebook, 10 Simple Ways to Bust Out of Your Midlife Funk. This will totally help you get going. Let's do this, ladies. Remember, being fulfilled in midlife really does start with your thinking. Divorced, married, or otherwise, it doesn't matter. Thanks so much for listening. Mm-hmm.